My name is Matthew Weil, and I direct the Elections Project at the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, D.C. This event is the culmination of several months of collaboration between BPC, the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU, and Harvard's Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. We wish this event wasn't necessary. The 2020 election saw the highest turnout of eligible voters in a century during a once-in-a-generation global pandemic. Election administrators, including all of the ones you will hear from today, performed admirably under extraordinarily difficult circumstances. They deserve our respect. Instead, election officials nationwide report emerging challenges that can undermine elections for decades to come. Those challenges had a new flavor last year. Election officials faced real vitriol and personal threats against themselves, their employees, and their families. They weathered partisan attacks and threats to undermine their independence. Many of those who served honorably in 2020 are considering leaving the field altogether before the next presidential election, and some already have. That is the context in which the Brennan Center, Ash Center, and BPC decided to collaborate early this year. American policy solutions mitigate these new worrisome realities of election misinformation. What are the ways to support election administrators to build capacity for the future? Is there a role for the federal government when it comes to protecting those who are responsible for providing all of us the fundamental right to vote? I promise to minimize my time on the screen today so you can hear directly from our rock star panelists. I also want to preemptively thank all the panelists and the moderators you will hear from today. Listen to their stories, hear their experiences, and learn from their proposed solutions. And now I want to turn over the event to Larry Norton, the director of the election reform program at the Brennan Center. We'll talk briefly about our work before launching us into the first panel. Larry. Thanks, Matt. Um, and, and thanks to you and BPC for hosting the event today. And, and I also want to thank all the participants today. Uh, I'm going to say something. I'm also going to keep it short, but I want to say something that shouldn't be controversial with the, the group that's watching today, but it, that is worth saying publicly as often as we can. Uh, election officials and workers are the unsung heroes of every election, but particularly the 2020 election. In the face of a pandemic, a flood of disinformation, and cyber threats from hostile foreign nations, states, they managed to run an election with the highest turnout in over 100 years, and one that has been called the most secure in American history at that. Today, the United States is facing an unprecedented attack on our democracy, and it is no accident um, given how important they proved themselves to be last year that election officials, used to working in the background, the referees and not the players, are a central target of this assault. Nor is it an accident that the attacks on election officials have come from domestic as well as foreign actors. Our adversaries abroad understand just as well as the enemies of democracy at home how critical our election officials are to free and fair elections in the United States. Uh, as Matt said, um, the work that went into today was a collaboration between the Brennan Center, Bipartisan Policy Center, and Ash Center at Harvard. Uh, over the course of three months, the organizations interviewed well over 40 election officials from over 20 states, uh, as well as many other election experts um, uh, in, in putting together uh, what ultimately became uh, our recommendations and analysis of the current situation. The Brennan Center also conducted a national survey of election officials with the Benenson Strategy Group this spring, uh, asking election officials how they themselves are experiencing the current crop of threats. Um, from all of that work, uh, the Brennan Center and the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, together put a report called Election Officials Under Attack, How to Protect Administrators and Safeguard Democracy. The report not only attempts to paint a comprehensive picture of the challenges election officials are facing today, uh, from death threats to disinformation uh, to political interference and how election officials do their jobs, um, but also in looking at solutions, recommendations for how we can fight back against uh, this assault. The past couple of weeks, I've been really heartened to see a gr growing attention to this issue, including from allies uh, like the California Voter Foundation and news organizations like Reuters. Um, I do want to say what's new in this work that we've completed, aside from uh, the national survey that I mentioned, is the very detailed set of solutions uh, at every level. Those solutions are critical. If we're going to protect our democracy, we must find a way to protect election officials and election workers. That's going to require a whole of society approach 
That includes federal and state legislatures and agencies, prosecutors, law enforcement, and social media companies. Most importantly, those with the power to do something should consult closely with election officials and workers themselves. There really is no exaggeration to say that the survival of our democracy depends on this. With that, to delve into the challenges that election officials are facing, as well as what can, what, what can be done to address them, I'm gonna turn the discussion over to a man who really needs no introduction, Matt Masterson, non-resident fellow at the Stanford in in Internet Observatory, formerly, of course, CISA election security lead and US EAC commissioner. Matt, thanks for leading us off today. In the Ash Center uh, for uh, allowing uh, this discussion to happen, for issuing the report and, and for telling the story uh, that I've heard from so many election officials about uh, you know, the environment that they had to operate in both before the election, uh, but certainly during and, and after the election as well, and, and ongoing, right? We continue to see uh, these narratives pushed and shared. So what I'm going to do is uh, briefly introduce our panelists uh, and jump right into the discussion uh, so that we can hear directly uh, from those that have been working on this. So uh, our first panelist is uh, Natalie Adona. She's the Assistant Clerk, Recorder, and Registrar of Voters in Nevada County, California. Uh, Natalie specializes in election administration. She runs elections, uh, election law and voting uh, rights research. Uh, Natalie's research interests are informed by her practical experience, uh, both as a poll worker and now as an election official uh, uh, across uh, California and the country. Uh, she's a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley. I think as a Stanford fellow, I'm supposed to respond to that somehow, but I'll let it go. Uh, and the American University where she holds a JD from Washington College of Law. So Natalie, thank you uh, for being with us. Next is Katie Harbath, who's a fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Katie uh, previously served as Facebook's Global Director of Policy Programs in charge of politics and government outreach. Uh, prior to Facebook, Katie was the, the Chief Digital Strategist at the National Republican Senatorial Committee. Uh, and she previously led digital strategies and positions at DCI Group uh, and the Rudy Giuliani for President Campaign and the Republican National Committee. So Katie, thank you so much for being with us and, and for your work uh, on this important topic. Next is uh, Gauri Ramachandran. I hope I did that right. I, uh, I even practiced uh, trying to do it right. Uh, she comes to the Brennan Center from Southwestern Law School in Los Angeles, California. Uh, while in law school, she was the editor-in-chief at uh, the Yale Law Journal. Uh, after graduating from law school in 2003, Gowry served as a law clerk to Judge Sidney R. Thomas on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in Billings, Montana. Uh, she received her undergraduate degree in mathematics from Yale College and a master's degree in statistics from Harvard uh, and was critical to the work uh, on this project. So, Gowry, thank you for being with us and, and for your work uh, on this report. Finally uh, is Al, Sch Al Schmidt, who's the uh, city commissioner in Philadelphia. Uh, he is in his third term as city commissioner. Al's one of three members on the bipartisan board of elections where he serves as the vice chairman. Al is a former senior analyst at the nonpartisan U.S. Government Accountability Office. Uh, prior to GAO, Al served as a po policy analyst for the Presidential Commission on Holocaust Assets. Uh, Al holds a PH PhD in history from Brandeis University and a BA in history from Allegheny College. Uh, Al has also been uh, one of the most uh, visual or outspoken uh, supporters uh, of uh, the security integrity of this election uh, and was in the storm uh, of many of the threats uh, shared throughout this report. So Al, uh, thank you for your leadership uh, and for being on this panel with us. So with that, we're going to jump right in. I'm going to pivot first to, to Gary. Uh, Gary, if you don't mind, can you give us some of the top line findings that we can use to inform this discussion around uh, the national uh, poll of election officials that's a part of this report? What do you hear from election officials and what should we take away from it? Yeah, so as uh, Larry mentioned, we interviewed uh, dozens and dozens of local election officials all across the country, and we just resoundingly heard um, you know, very similar themes from all of them that they had worked tirelessly, you know, so hard to pull off a successful, secure, safe election in the middle of a global pandemic, um, you know, often having to work remotely and all of that. And it was just so disheartening to them that, uh, and just stinging that in the face of all of that, they then were subject to, um, you know, disinformation campaigns, untruths about, uh, Security of the elections they ran, the fairness of the elections they ran, um, even though, you know, they're such uh, honest people and dedicated to free and fair elections, 
And then also actually, you know, physical and uh, violent uh, threats uh, that were coming from folks online, over email, phone calls, all of that sort of thing. So the two of those things together just, uh, you know, packed a really big punch. And in terms of the survey that the Benenson Strategy Group conducted on our behalf, um, it was a national survey of local election officials, and it found that approximately one third felt unsafe because of their job as a local election official, which is really a shocking number. And approximately one in five had actually received uh, threats uh, because of their, uh, you know, sort of violent threats because of their status as an election official. So it's really, um, you know, I think folks have started to hear individual stories from certain uh, uh, election officials in the news in the past few days. But I think those numbers really indicate that the problem is, um, is rampant and it's widespread. Um, and so I'm really excited for us to talk about different solutions today and hear from, hear from election officials, uh, their views on what we can do to move forward. Gary, thank you. And I appreciate you teeing up the conversation. I'm gonna to turn to, to Al and Natalie next in, in sort of an unfair way, ask you to represent your colleagues in the 8,800 uh, local jurisdictions across this country. But as you hear Gary share some of the, the numbers behind the experience, I, I wonder if you don't mind sharing both your own experience through this election. Election officials face uh, and don't shy away from both criticism and transparency. Uh, certainly in every election, uh, emotions run high. What, what was your experience? What made this experience so much different uh, in the, the rhetoric, the vitriol uh, that was directed your way at, at your colleagues as well? And, and uh, you know, how would you encapsulate or, or share uh, what you're hearing and what you experienced in the 2020 election? So uh, we'll go to Al first and then Natalie. I would say one big challenge is that normally in an election season, candidates attack other candidates, um, not attack the election officials who are running the election, uh, unless they've done something you know, wrong. Um, and that's not the case here. In this, in this last election cycle, uh, there was an effort uh, most certainly to make the election administrators participants in all of this uh, and to suggest nefarious motives. And um, the threats and all the rest, I think, flow out of that from what is normally a pretty important but obscure uh, position, which is to uh, run elections. Thanks, Al. For me, for me I mean, it's, it's interesting because in a lot of ways, the pandemic uh, shut us off to the public uh, in, in a certain way, because I mean, my office is very small, both in terms of the number of people who work here and the, the physical space. So, um, you know, when we invited in observers, we can only invite in a few at a time. Uh, when we had early voting, it was, sort of in the same building, but separate from where my office is located. So in a way I was hearing about you know, everything that was happening to my peers in my state and across the country. And, um, you know, in a way feeling somewhat removed from it, but at the same time, uh, I have to admit that there were moments I did not feel very secure. So for example, I would leave the office and sometimes by myself at you know, 10, 30, 11 at night and look at a dark and empty parking lot and sort of wonder, was this a good idea <laughs> for me to um, leave by myself? Uh, there was also a moment that, that made headlines uh, where we had a pop-up rally happened in the parking lot on the weekend at my office. I happened to be the only person here. I knew that it was blocking our vote by mail drop box in that parking lot. And because I was by myself and because I got a sort of very sharp sense that this group was becoming more and more radicalized, I did not approach anyone at the rally. Um, I found myself you know, taking pictures of the event, but crouching down because I was afraid there was a possibility that someone could see me or my silhouette and um, sort of know immediately that I was an elections person and that you know, somehow 
I was going to interfere with their activities. So in a way, I'm very fortunate to have not personally have been the target of the public's threats, but at the same time, hearing about everything that was going on around me and around the country, I, I can't say that I wasn't nervous. Yeah, and I, I think uh, both Al and, and Natalie, your, your reflections are, are reflected in the report from the survey uh, that was done in, in, in the conversations I've been fortunate to have in my work at Stanford. Um, you know, uh, election officials, uh, even not just in the heart of it, but, but outside of swing jurisdictions have faced uh, just sobering and, and scary uh, threats of violence, uh, insinuations, both online and, and through uh, phone calls. I wonder, uh, as we all, uh, as the panel reflects on uh, what happened in this election and then 2022 and 2024, I mean, 2022 is here. We're, we're in it already, right, for election officials. You're already planning, you're already preparing. Uh, what changes either uh, for, for Gary or Katie have, have you heard that, that need to take place that are recommended in the report? And then for Natalie and Al, given what you've experienced, what your colleagues have experienced, uh, what what operating environment, what operational realities, security realities are changing for you uh, to have to implement? And what do you need to, to achieve those, whether it's resourcing support from the federal government otherwise? So uh, we'll start, uh, I, I think, uh, with, with uh, Katie, and then we can just kind of jump in. Uh, thanks, Matt. I think that one of the main things that um, <clears throat> looking at is you've got redistricting that's still gonna happen and that is coming late. And so concerns about helping to make sure people have accurate information and understand that it's going to be okay if maybe they're voting in a different district than what they voted in in 2020, helping them to understand what that process is, is gonna be really important in addition to understanding what the new rules are, um, given all the different legislation that is passing in these states, I think could potentially be quite confusing for voters uh, who were already confused in 2020 and will feel even more confused in 2022. So I think there's work that can be done now of working across you know, tech companies, civil society, the election officials, and others of thinking about how do we help prepare the American public for what voting in 2022 will look like. Thanks, Katie. So I'll jump in. Um, yep. I think um, in addition to uh, sort of making sure, um, you know, as Katie mentioned that, um, you know, the accurate information about where to vote, what district someone is in, um, all of that is gonna be super important. Amplifying uh, the voices of those who have that accurate information, which is local election officials. They're the ones who are gonna be administering those elections in 2022. Um, we also in the report are recommending um, sort of from the law enforcement side and the physical security side um, that the uh, Department of Justice actually uh, convene a task force specifically uh, looking at um, these threats to election officials. Um, often these threats are illegal, obviously, uh, <laughs> intimidating someone, and especially trying to intimidate someone uh, out of uh, performing their job to um, administer our democracy um, is prime. And so uh, we're recommending a task force so that both federal and state law enforcement can work together with input from local election officials and other stakeholders um, to really put, um, put some attention on this problem and make sure, uh, make sure that people are deterred from, uh, from engaging in this activity going forward. Um, we're also recommending that state governments really provide the funding and the training for local election officials to protect themselves, to secure their offices. Uh, so folks like Natalie don't have to feel afraid um, when they're in their small office. Um, so uh, extra funding to make sure that those offices are physically secure, that election officials um, can protect their personal information online, uh, remove it from public databases, um, the way that uh, often states allow domestic violence survivors to remove your information from public databases. Um, there's a whole lot that can be done on that side to beef up, um, you know, the physical security and uh, comfort that election officials have moving into 2022. Yeah, thanks, Gary. And and for Alan and Natalie, as as you reflect on the question, I, I wonder if you can also weigh in on what type of support you received from either local 
state or federal law enforcement, what more you think you're going to need moving forward, uh, given these experiences? And, and what's, what's the appropriate role? What do you need specifically from the federal level uh, that you either got in this election and you need more of, or, or you simply didn't feel uh, supported that, that you would like to see more leadership on? I think after every election, um, there are lessons learned. And one of the biggest challenges moving forward, I think, is balancing security and transparency. The 2020 election in Philadelphia was held in the Philadelphia Convention Center, which was a completely controlled environment surrounded by a phalanx of Philadelphia police officers on the outside, Philadelphia sheriffs on the inside, and private security also. But at the same time, making sure that election observers have access that they rightfully have to observe our operations in the canvassing uh, and counting of those ballots, which we were able to provide. So I think the biggest challenge moving forward is how do we, um, how do we now harden this target in Homeland Security terminology um, against threats, and at the same time, make sure that we can provide as we should uh, access to observers so that they can um, you know, observe the, 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 the counting of the votes. Mm -hmm. On the federal level, just very quickly, on the federal level, I would say it's, it's less on a secure, an immediate security side because the Philadelphia Police Department, in our case, and Sheriff's Department was terrific. It's mainly on the investigative side because they have resources that our city's departments don't have directly. Uh, so when there are threats, when there is um, uh, some sort of um, chatter uh, about things headed our way, uh, that the federal agencies obviously take those seriously, investigate those, um, and track those down. Yeah, and Al, I know, uh, for instance, in Philadelphia, uh, across Pennsylvania, uh, physical security, protective security advisors from CISA, uh, we're out at local election offices before the election working on, um, you know, improving the physical security around those offices. I, I think uh, just from my experience, uh, taking what they learned from those individual assessments and compiling it into some advice, some guidance to help uh, local election officials, even local law enforcement, uh, harden that target, as you said, uh, I think would be really valuable. Some data driven uh, analysis on that. Uh, Natalie, I, I wonder, uh, based on your experience, if, if you could share uh, you know, what additional steps you may be looking to take heading into 2022? Uh, and uh, do you have what you need to accomplish those things? Thanks. Um, and, you know, just to sort of bounce off of Al's earlier point, I think that's absolutely correct that I mean, you do need to consider that elections is a very public process. Uh, and you can't, forget about that when you also uh, think about the security side. Now, I, I have the um, opportunity to learn a little bit more about what we need for 2022 a little bit earlier because California is very likely going to have a gubernatorial recall in 2021, uh, the date of which we will soon know. And um, you know, I think that there were a lot of lessons learned from 2020 on the federal side, you know, in addition to the need for, for funding, which, which I get, uh, you know, I was very comforted to know that I had the contact information for the FBI local field office sent over to me along with some brochures on, um, you know, how to, how to report up situations but you know I was also fortunate enough that our Secretary of State invited FBI and other stakeholders into uh, a virtual county situation room so in all of the days leading up to the election we did not have to contact a bunch of agencies three four five times we could just make one communication and everybody would know what we were going through and could either advise us or uh, take action. So that was really helpful. You know, I think that the state was also really an important player for us, not only with planning the election, but also helping us to get what we needed for security. 
And um, you know, I was also very comforted that you know, they were very responsive to every request, no matter how small it was. You know, and I, I also engaged with the local law enforcement here. I think that was helpful in a way, but you know, I also think that, um, you know, and where we could do better is they, they didn't quite understand, I think, what, you know, how serious everything had become. Uh, and I, I hope that now that we've had incidents like the one that happened at the US Capitol on January 6th, that people now understand what mis and disinformation about elections does to people and that it, it does need to be taken seriously. Um, so I have provided recommendations to the Secretary of State for how they can better communicate with the State Office of Emergency Services and you know, other agencies to, to help better support us. On the observer side, you know, I, I think that what's going to be important are two things. One, more intense training of my temporary staff. They're not always informed as to the particulars of election law, and they certainly don't know uh, and don't track all of the changes that I do at the um, sort of state legislative level. The other thing is, you know, what I've been telling my staff and others is the truth is the best inoculant to mis and disinformation. Always tell the truth, even if it is hard for the person on the other end of the line or across the counter to hear. They need to hear it. And at, at the end of the day, I really believe you'll be better off for it. Yeah, well said, Natalie. Thank you. Uh, we're going to pivot to mis and disinfo and its role in, in these threats in the operating environment of election officials. Uh, I've been asked to remind those uh, that are attending online uh, that you can submit questions uh, through the live chat on YouTube or Facebook or on Twitter uh, using hashtag BPC live. So uh, please feel free. We've gotten a couple questions in. Uh, I know that the folks are tracking uh, those questions. Natalie, you, you teed up uh, rather well uh, kind of the pivot towards uh, mis and disinfo around this process and the experience uh, for uh, election officials in, in trying to combat that. And so I'm going to uh, go to Katie uh, with this, the first part of this question, which is uh, there's a, Obviously, we've got tech platforms, uh, Facebook and, and Twitter are most often cited, but a variety of tech platforms uh, involved uh, in the sharing of information and, frankly, a vital part uh, of our election ecosystem at this part, point, right? Election officials rely on the platforms, but also voters are relying on the platforms for information. Uh, I'm curious as to your thoughts, given your experience, uh, what do we do, how do we engage as a community uh, both election officials, researchers, academia in working with those platforms uh, to help combat mis and disinfo around uh, elections, but also uh, to empower to raise the voices of election officials louder, right? So that the information, the facts around the process uh, are most prevalent uh, for those that are engaging on those platforms. Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, in 2020, we just saw an unprecedented amount of activity uh, um, from the various platforms, you know, whether it was a Facebook, a Twitter, or a Google, Google, but, you know, even uh, Nextdoor and TikTok and Snap, many were all um, doing a lot of efforts in addition to civil society and the work of election officials that I think it is important to recognize that there was record turnout. Um, and for that to happen in a year like 2020, um, I think a lot of that was because of how much they were working together, but it didn't come without its challenges, as, as you mentioned. Um, I think that you know each tech platform is a little different in terms of the audiences that they have and, and how they can reach people. Election officials only have so many resources uh, to their disposals and time uh, in order to understand how to use these different platforms. I think there's also a question too that we've been seeing about who is the right messenger and what are the different messengers that are putting out information about not just you know the the mechanics of voting, what the day is, you know what the deadlines are for reg registering to vote, um, but also um, around. Uh, <clears throat> um, 
Sorry, I lost my train of thought because my Alexa decided to turn on in the middle. It's no problem. It's the, no the problem. Right of home, of home <laughs> panel, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but anyways, I think there's a lot of work to be done in terms of there's so many election officials and so many groups who are wanting to help that how do we help them to not only combine forces um, and continue to think about working well together, but thinking about who are the right messengers for getting this information out. That's where I was um, because um, you have you know, like we've been talking about candidates and elected officials sharing information and thoughts about the validity of different types of voting, about fraud. And I think a lot more work needs to be done around thinking about what are the best ways for helping people to better understand this information? Who are the best messengers that might be at the local level um, to help get this to help get this information out? And so I think now is the time, your point, like 2022 is already here. Um, I think 2021 and these next six months are a time to, to be having those conversations about what worked and what didn't work and what do we need to start thinking about to be ready because 2022 is not in November of next year, right? It starts with the primaries. It starts pretty early next year. Um, and so I think we need to remember that in terms of timing. Thanks, Katie. I, Al, I wonder uh, in your experience uh, in Philadelphia, you know, it, I know at the federal level, the state level with the National Association of Secretaries of State and state election directors, there was a push to, to constantly reinforce that, that state and in particular local election officials are trusted sources of information. And yet, despite that, uh, we saw the, the, the massive amounts of, of mis and disinfo around the process that was spread both from the bottom up and, and, and top down from, from larger accounts. I, I wonder if, if you can share two things, Al. One is uh, what it's like to be in that hurricane of, of disinfo uh, across the platforms. And two, what what uh, techniques, tactics you used uh, to try to make your voice louder, to push information, and, and what you might do differently, if anything, uh, as you look towards future elections? Well, I, I was hoping that you'd have the answer to those questions, Matt, <laughs> <laughs> or, any, or anyone yell, else. This, yell louder, Al. Yell panel. louder. That's what it feels like, yelling yeah. into, the, into, the, into the wind. Um, you know, forgive the comparison, but in a lot of ways, misinformation is like a virus and it spreads uh, and is impossible to contain uh, once it's spread. You know, we are all, every election administrator and everyone involved with elections is running full tilt to, uh, to count the votes at the end of the day around election time. You have very little time for our, you know, little city department uh, and our team of people to counter every little bit of misinformation that's out there. It is really, you know, I'm, I've never been a fan of Mark Twain quotes, but there's some quote about the, a lie making its way around the world before the truth gets its, uh, gets its shoes on or something like that. That is absolutely true. There was a report that, um, that not only had one a uh, police officer who died in the line of duty years ago voted in the previous election, but uh, half a dozen others did too. And that got a lot of attention. It was entirely untrue, all of it. Uh, other celebrities from Philadelphia, J uh, Joe Frazier, the boxer, it was like Joe Frazier died years ago, he voted in the last election. There was no truth to it at all, but it was everywhere. And you know, even if we spent all of our day and we don't have time to do that. Countering those sort of things, it's impossible to catch up to it and it's impossible to, to counter it. And, and probably also a little bit like a virus, once it's spreading, you can't stop it. The most important thing, and I think it's one of the main things that I, that I really gained also from reading the, the report, is that it's really largely also about inoculating people against that misinformation on the front end. So there isn't already a, um, uh, a kind of fertile mind for it to, to take root and grow, uh, because once that happens, it's too late. Yeah, well said. I, I wonder, Gowry and, and Katie, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot. Um, and, and that is, you know, you hear from, from local election officials like, like Al and Natalie that you know, they felt like they were yelling into the wind that, 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 you know, the waterfall or the flood of disinfo was was more than they because in the end, their focus has to be on maintaining the integrity of the process, counting votes accurately, uh, items like that. 
I, I wonder if you could, what more do we need from social media companies, uh, from the private sector to, to help raise uh, the voices of election officials as we look to, as Al said, inoculate the public and, and provide them facts now uh, in advance of the next election? You know, um, it's great you asked that. Um, what Al just mentioned that, you know, hurricane screaming into the wind, we heard that over and over in the interviews we did with local election officials. So it's definitely, um, Al, you're not alone in, uh, in having that experience. Um, and it's so true that, you know, Matt, you had mentioned there are over 8,000 local election officials in the United States. Um, they're, they don't have time and they're no match for, uh, you know, someone who is a uh, elected leader at the national level spreading misinformation um, on in both traditional and uh, social media. So it's really important that we take the whole of society approach to this. Um, one thing that's uh, helpful, I think, is that, you know, these online platforms, they're really the experts in what makes people engage, what uh, <laughs> uh, makes people listen, because uh, they're the ones that, uh, you know, have have that data. And so um, it's really on them, I think, to try to amplify and give a voice to local election officials so that people can be inoculated, as Al said, with the truth ahead of time. Um, but I think uh, the platforms uh, can get some assistance. Uh, we're actually recommending that uh, a national registry, you'd be surprised, this doesn't exist, <laughs> just listing, uh, these are all the local election officials. Um, these are their social media handles. These are their websites, right? This is their online presence. That kind of registry could really be uh, put together uh, by other stakeholders like uh, CISA in conjunction with uh, nonprofits like the US Vote Foundation, uh, with groups like the National Association of State Election Directors. Uh, if that comprehensive registry is put together, then there's really no limit in a sense to what uh, the social media companies can do with it. They could uh, perhaps um, uh, give special amplification to messages from those accounts in the months running up to an election. Uh, they could give uh, special uh, training to those accounts, free advertising, right, on uh, pre helping to create content um, so that those 8,000 local election officials aren't just sort of on their own trying to figure out what message is going to get across, what message is going to be heard, um, how am I going to make this uh, uh, be heard instead of feel like I'm screaming into the wind. Um, so there's all kinds of things that can be done to amplify the truth. Uh, once uh, the, these private companies are able to go to uh, a registry that really comprehensively lists who the trusted uh, administrators are across the United States. Um, but there's, um, it's definitely uh, going to take a sort of all hands, uh, all hands on deck. Approach. Katie, you, you've been uh, on the inside, as it were, in, in those rooms. What, what, uh, what did you need uh, or did, did Facebook need? Obviously, Facebook did an election central, right? Tried to amplify the voices through that. What, what more needs to be done? Yeah, I think, I mean, a list like that would be amazing with the social media uh, accounts um, of those of those election officials to start. I also agree that I think this does need to be a whole society approach. Um, people are not just getting this information on social media. You know, they are getting it from other media outlets, whether it be cable, et cetera, um, you know, radio. And so I think there does need to be kind of a holistic approach and, and that of looking at how people get in for, get information. Um, and I do think that there continues to be a lot of work and, you know, I think social media companies can play a big role in this of understanding. It's not just like what type of stuff gets the most engagement and things of that nature, but what really helps people to change their mind? What helps them, you know, again, I talked about the messengers earlier, but also, you know, some of the social media companies uh, tried labels on content to try to give it more context about, you know, mail-in voting and the validity of, you know, and how secure mail-in vo mail voting is. But that doesn't necessarily mean just because you put it in front of somebody that they're necessarily going to believe it. Um, it doesn't necessarily just mean that amplifying the content from election officials, unfortunately, means that people are going to believe it. And so I think that um, continued work of understanding how to help think about behavioral changes for people and also just help people understand what the role of election officials are. Um, I don't think that many, you know, other than when they do go to, to vote, they don't under, I don't think many people even understand there's 8,800 
of them and how different it is um, in different places. And so I think starting earlier on and thinking about how to get, continue to educate the American public and if there's a role for social media companies in which to, to do that in an ongoing basis and not just paying attention six months before November um, is something that I think should be highly encouraged for, for all of these companies. Yeah, thanks, Katie. And you actually raised, you, you teed up the sort of, uh, you know, it's not just November uh, before the election, but in fact, what we're seeing now uh, is post-election time, right? We're, we're months uh, out from uh, the, the 2020 election and we're still having these conversations. And so I wonder, I'll start with Natalie and, uh, and then Al, but, but get the entire panel's thoughts. Uh, with the continuation of the mis and disinfo, with the continuation of the, the lies around the election, we see uh, an ongoing pervasive campaign to undermine trust even after the results are certified, uh, everything uh, has taken place. And so I wonder, as you sort of reflect on your experiences as local election officials, what, what changes, what approaches uh, do you think we need to make either locally within your own jurisdiction or even nationally uh, to... to recognize and combat, uh, you know, the ability of, of a loser of elections to just drag this narrative on and, and drag democracy through the mud uh, on an ongoing basis, even after the elections closed out. So I'll start with Natalie and, th and then go to Al. Well, so you're giving me the easy question. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, what I would say to that is, um, you know, what I do, or my approach anyway, is to really pay attention to what is making the news right now. Uh, and, you know, what is making the news from my vantage point are voting systems and the um, activities that are going on in Arizona uh, that, that many are calling an audit. But <laughs> frankly, I'm, I'm not quite sure how I would describe it. And to for any any one of my citizens who who calls in or uh, you know approaches me and wants to raise questions about the 2020 election, one being very clear about what it is they're asking, and if I am not clear, being very honest with them and say, hey, I, I don't think that I understand what you mean. Uh, tell me more. Uh, I, I, the last thing I want to do is dismiss anyone's sincerely held belief that something went wrong and, um, you know, not make them feel like they're not being taken seriously because I mean, that, I think that is my duty to take everyone very seriously and to be very clear on what the law allows me to do, what it does not allow me to do, and be very firm about what our office's posture is on any given thing. And I'll give an example. So recently I got a call from uh, someone in my county who wanted a forensic audit of the 2020 election. And so I asked him, what is that? <laughs> because I, I literally have no context for what a forensic audit would be in elections. Uh, and then you know, it proceeded to address some of the issues that he raised at the end of the conversation, I said, you know, I, I respect that you have an opinion. Uh, I am not, you know, here to change your mind. And at the same time, we are not going to be doing what you suggest because the law does not allow us. And two, we have already audited the election. These were the results of that audit. And there is no reason for me to <clears throat> re-audit anything. I, under law, I can't even break the seals on those election materials unless I get a court order. Um, and he was upset, but his question got answered. So, you know, he, he has many avenues um, uh, in other parts of the county to express his grievances. Uh, I am fortunate that <laughs> this person has chosen not to, you know, sort of make it personal to me. And uh, he was able, I, I hope, to move on. Um, that will be my approach for, for every uh, election. But the truth is, Matt, I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of making it up as I go along, uh, I, I feel like. So, you know, the, the key things are clear communication, transparency, tell people the truth. 
Love that. Al? You know, I guess at the national level, it was, it started out very encouraging when um, tech companies running social media platforms began flagging things, right? So there's something that said hundreds of thousands of more votes were cast in uh, Pennsylvania than voters who voted. Um, so the next thing you know, that ends up being something that says this statement is disputed. And I went from being really encouraged by it to like, it's not disputed. It's just simply not true. <laughs> there, there's no dispute. It's categorically false and a lie with no basis in fact. Um, so those flags went from being encouraging to, uh, to almost immediately frustrating. I don't know what else that they could have done, but, um, but it was good that they did that. On the, on the local level, uh, and by the way, a, a Republican congressman from Pennsylvania today quoted that in an interview saying there were 100,000 more votes cast in Pennsylvania than voters who voted. Uh, just totally untrue. I don't know where people are getting this. I don't know if they're choosing to be liars or, or are really just fools, uh, but it's gotta be one or the other because they should know better. Um, on the local level, I think, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a former, uh, former auditor for GAO. Um, I am, I realize how important audits are. I'm an election administrator. I realize how important elections are. I might not be a ninja, but what I do know is that Philadelphia will fight all of this nonsense at every step of the way uh, in court. And if they wanted to take us to court, uh, they could. And, and it's, no, it's no big thing because I'm confident that we'll win. The elections in Pennsylvania have been audited not once, but twice. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it's, it's important that we, we take these things seriously and we, uh, fight them before they can get any foothold when we all know the objective isn't about a free and fair election. We had a free and fair election and in Pennsylvania, it wasn't even close. Um, it's about, uh, eroding trust in our democratic process. Yeah. Well said, Al. Thank you. Uh, we're going to turn to, to audience questions. I, I'll say, uh, just for my part in, in, in that last part, uh, the, the social media companies, those of us at CISA working with uh, state and local election officials, I think did a fairly good job kind of red teaming out what we expected the narratives to be, the challenges to be around everything from, from vote by mail to election night reporting to things like that. The area where I uh, just did not uh, anticipate and, and reflect on a lot is the staying power of it, the, the fact that it, it's still going. Uh, and election officials in an under-resourced, under-supported uh, profession being asked to fight the pri previous battle on an ongoing basis while attempting to run the next uh, election moving forward uh, is an impossible task. And, and we really need to deal with uh, how uh, to support them so that they can move forward with their actual jobs rather than uh, having to fight the battle after battle on an, on an election, as Al said, uh, that wasn't particularly close. Uh, the, the first uh, question, this can go to any of the panelists, so jump in, don't be shy, uh, from, from an audience member is, uh, who's going to stop these uh, groups from seizing voters' ballots and handling them like's happened in Maricopa County? A couple of you have referenced this already. Uh, while there's no one willing to protect uh, these votes and equipment, I would disagree with that. I think uh, state and local election officials are doing everything in their power. I'll just address that. But wondering your reflections on sort of the, we'll call it the activity in Maricopa County, the exercise, we won't call it an audit, uh, that's taking place uh, and what we need to do to support election officials, uh, both, both to uh, share the facts of the election actually being audited already, in some cases, multiple times, uh, and then to, um, you know, to, to move on uh, and not have this continued uh, attempt to relitigate. I'll just jump in. Uh, my understanding of the, you know, what is happening specifically in Arizona is, you know, sort of out of the Maricopa County election officials' hands. I mean, when you get a subpoena from the state Senate, you, you, you either follow it or you don't. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know that I would do anything differently in that situation. You know, I think that being in California, uh, we have a you know, sort of very strong um, presence at the sort of state and local level. Um, so, I mean, 
I think that we are doing, as you point out, Matt, everything that we can to protect ballots, to protect voting equipment. We have, you know, just a sort of long list of procedures for how to protect ballots and machines and uh, voting systems more generally and registration systems. Um, um, so I don't think that it's true that there's no one, you know, sort of really at the forefront here. Uh, one thing that I, I think came up in the 2020 election that does concern me at times is the security of Dropbox locations. There were some Dropbox locations that were tampered with. Uh, in my own jurisdiction, I, um, I told you before that uh, there was actually people blocking the Dropbox and they had all kinds of electioneering uh, materials around the Dropbox at the time. And um, you know, I think that there are going to be updates to laws to protect our drop boxes, but you know, still with some of them being available 24-7, uh, it is hard to have a human being watch them all the time. And it really, you know, sort of calls into question how we protect the, the ballots that are in there. I think that we have very secure drop boxes. And you know, people come up with creative ways to, to sort of do what they do. Uh, so I, I think that is definitely on my radar. We have um, something around 20 drop boxes around the county because of all the people who vote here in my county. About 90% of those ballots are cast by mail, either by actually putting them in USPX box or, or dropping them off in a drop box. Um, I would also say that, you know, th this is a sort of common you know, complaint of observers who you know, always want to know, you know how we're handling equipment, how we're handling ballots, but um, at the same time manage to sort of get our, their understanding of our procedures wrong. And so what I would say to people is, you know, call the local election official. I mean, for, for me personally, and I know my peers share this position, we're happy to have you observe any part of the process. Uh, you can ask questions, you can learn about everything. Uh, that's what I tell everybody. I have yet to have a person who is not used to observing, you know, come take advantage of that opportunity to learn about what it is that we do. Uh, but please, you know, come in. I try to share stuff on social media, but it's only really me doing it in my office. There's there's only five of us, including me, who are working on the election side permanent full time. So, you know, I, I can't get to everybody, but, uh, you know, I do say, come on in. Our process is open. We're not trying to hide anything. Thanks, Natalie. Anyone else on that question? I'll jump in in terms of these partisan reviews. That's what I'll call them, <laughs> Matt, that are occurring, um, like the one in Arizona. I do think it's important that we, you know, lay some blame on those who are actually uh, trying to conduct these reviews. So the state Senate in Arizona is the one that issued the subpoena and handed over ballots to, a, you know, to ninjas who seem to be anything but ninjas in terms of their ability uh, to uh, run a, you know, proper uh, secure audit. So we do need to lay some blame for that. In the same way that Natalie, you know, really firmly and patiently um, explained uh, to the person who called her office looking for a forensic audit, whatever that is, uh, you know, maybe some of these state legislators need to do the same with their constituents when they're getting pressure uh, to conduct uh, these sort of pointless, pointless reviews. I think it's important we mention that. Thanks, Gary. R very quickly, we only have a couple of minutes left, uh, but I, I wanted to ask this. There's a, a question around uh, what are the reactions from, from Al and Natalie uh, to the threat of criminal penalties that some states are proposing or have even passed laws uh, against election officials, fines or criminal penalties uh, for technical infractions of procedures, uh, things around ballot drop boxes, particularly given what Gary just said, uh, where uh, perhaps those uh, or certainly those pushing mis and disinfo uh, have faced very little accountability uh, and now election officials. So any reaction, Al or Natalie, uh, to, to, that, uh, to that push in some states? I think it's really disheartening. I, I, I don't think that it breeds trust in the public and what we do. Uh, I also don't think it incentivizes 
anyone who is, you know, sort of otherwise passionate and, you know, sort of smart and who, who wants to be able to serve people to actually serve in, in election offices, you know, it, it just breeds this, this culture of being nervous for, for messing things up. And, you know, it turns out you, you never really messed up in the first place. Um, I, I think it's sad. I, I hope that these laws are reversed. You know, and I, I think I can only add to uh, the problem that the report identified, which is the potential loss of experienced uh, election administrators across the country, because with no evidence of election administrators having done wrong, um, essentially what this is is a legislative effort to intimidate election board workers. Uh, it's not a threat the way that somebody is threatening, threatening you or your family with your physical security, but it's most certainly a threat. Uh, it's just, instead of it taking place from an anonymous you know, text message, it's in the form of legislation. And I, and I think it will unfortunately only add to the departure of experienced election administrators. Yeah, thank you, Al. Uh, so with this, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up this panel. I, I want to thank each and every panelist uh, for your thoughtful responses, uh, for the work uh, on the report, both, both Katie and Gary and, and the folks uh, that, that worked on this. And, and to Al and Natalie, uh, I'll say to you uh, and to all of your colleagues across the country, uh, what you deserve to hear, which is thank you and gratitude for your incredible work, uh, for your courage uh, in, in protecting democracy and serving your voters, which is in the end, uh, what, what your commitment is to and, and uh, the thousands of, of state and local election officials, uh, election workers in the face of a global pandemic uh, in response to uh, record turnout uh, did nothing short than heroic activities uh, to ensure that this election was accurate, uh, was secure, and um, was carried out with integrity. Uh, and and if, if we could just reinforce to voters uh, over and over that election officials are transparent uh, that this process is bipartisan uh, and that, that, as Natalie said, observation and, and participation is available to you. It's why we run elections at, at, at the local level. And that those who run elections, as you heard from Natalie and Al today, are professionals. They care deeply about this. They work incredibly hard year round uh, to ensure the integrity of this process. Uh, it, it isn't just something that they wake up uh, some Tuesday in November and decide to do, but in fact, dedicate their lives to. Uh, in order to ensure the accuracy and security. And so uh, the more we can reinforce to voters the professionalization, the transparency, and the, the absolute bipartisan commitment that folks have, uh, I think the better off we'll be. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all the election officials out there for your incredible work. And with that, I'll hand it off uh, to Matt Weil, uh, who I think will introduce a, a short video that was put together. And Matt, thank you for the work on this and, and the chance to moderate this panel. Well, Matt, Matt stole all my thunder. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank the panel, thank the, the moderator as well. The one thing I, I do miss the, the most about um, having to do these events online virtual is that we have no round of applause. So I will give you a round of applause. Uh, I really appreciate the, the panelists for joining us today. Um, we are going to continue um, you know, delving into these topics. We want to talk about um, the threats to independence and, and what it's going to take to um, recruit the next generation of election officials um, with this new reality. Um, but while we are shifting virtual chairs on our virtual stage, uh, the Brennan Center communications team has put together an amazing video. Um, and I, I think that Gary has mentioned it and um, Larry has mentioned it, but you know, over the past few months, you know, the Ash Center, Brennan Center, BPC have done dozens of interviews with election officials. And I, I can tell you from personal experience, these were difficult conversations. Um, several of those um, election officials agreed to um, join us for this, this video to memorialize what happened last year so that it never happens again. And I um, proudly uh, introduce this video um, and we'll be back in about three minutes. He will demand the truth and you will pay for your lying remarks, you liberal Flying rhino, we will take you out. Your family, your life, you watch your back.
They had assault rifles. A pipe bomb. You're gonna get what's coming to you. They threatened my life. Couldn't go anywhere without the police officers. When we had officers on the roof of our building. We had go bags ready for my family and my children. We recognize that the divisiveness in our country was really growing. We also recognized the role that social media was playing. I had never, ever had that before. I'd never had people so engaged and enraged about what we were doing just to ensure that people could vote. There were people who uh, showed up outside of election officials' houses, uh, armed people that showed up outside of offices, threatening phone calls, harassment. And online discussions about types of ammunition and guns to use on me. It became a daily occurrence outside of our facility to have anywhere from uh, 50 to 150 individuals outside. Some of them were armed. There was a fence sort of separating the building from the, from the protesters. Uh, and they were armed. We were terribly concerned about every threat, everything that was said, because we just didn't know. I was encountered with a uh, partisan operative campaign manager with his cell phone, where he videotaped me hurling insults and accusations. It had over 400,000 views. Commenters were saying we should find out where she lives. We should hang her for treason. She should be shot. This is not what um... I, I expect uh, to have to really run and fight for my life. My son began getting uh, threats that were intended for me. They're leaving their families and their loved ones to come and do a job that was supposed to be just to, to count votes or to administer an election. We actually had record number of turnouts of people that came out in a pandemic. Everything that you had written in a playbook as far as like how you normally do things in an election cycle, had to be set aside. It makes one pause and say, is this really what I want to do? This to me was an effort to undermine confidence in our entire electoral process. We think about that happening in other places around the world, but that's happened in the United States and it's happened specifically because of the big lie. Election officials are in this for passion, for service. The public servants all around this country that, that run our elections at the at the state and local level. Uh, you know, they don't do this job to get rich and they care more about the integrity of elections than anyone I know. Thank you again to the Brennan Center staff for putting that together, that excellent video. I want to quickly move to the next panel because I want to have as much time for these panels as possible. Uh, the next panel will be moderated by Eduardo Cortez. Eduardo has experience at the state um, and the local level and the federal level when it comes to elections, having worked for Fairfax County, Virginia, as Commissioner of Elections in Virginia, and at the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. Eduardo, the panel is yours. of election officials and president of Ackerman Consulting uh, as a government relations and lobbying firm. Uh, he specializes in elections, public utilities, procurement, and healthcare. And he received his BA in political science from the University of Dayton. Uh, Justin Roebuck is the county clerk and register of deeds for Ottawa County in Michigan. Uh, not a lot going on there last election, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, I'd like to uh, do the brief intro for our panelists. Um, Aaron Ackerman, uh, joining us today, he's the Executive Director of the Ohio Association of Election Officials and President of Ackerman Consulting. 
a government relations and lobbying firm. Uh, he specializes in elections, public utilities, uh, procurement, and healthcare. Uh, he received his BA in political science from the University of Dayton. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for joining us. Uh, Justin Roebuck is the county clerk and register of deeds for Ottawa County in Michigan. Uh, he's the chief election officer overseeing 23 local municipalities and 220,000 registered voters within the county. Uh, Justin serves as co-chair of the Michigan Council of Election Officials, as well as the legislative uh, committee of the Michigan County Clerks. Uh, he's also a member of the standards board of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. Uh, previously, Justin served on the executive staff of the Michigan Secretary of State and as a campaign manager for U.S. Representative Tim Wahlberg, and he's a graduate of Hillsdale College in Michigan. Uh, Justin, thank you for joining us today. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Lisa Danitz. Uh, Lisa is an independent consultant and has worked in the voting rights, money and politics, and democracy field as a policy expert. Uh, advocate and lawyer for 20 years. Uh, she is uh, joining us here on behalf of the Brennan Center and her, her work has focused on increasing uh, election and campaign-based political participation in society through public policy research, uh, litigation, executive and legislative advocacy and public education. Uh, Lisa, Lisa has uh, extensively published and been a frequent speaker on voting rights issues uh, including testimony before the Senate Rules and Administration Committee, uh, the uh, House Administration Subcommittee on Elections, uh, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, Lisa received her B.S. from Yale University and her J.D. Uh, from New York University School of Law. So thank you, Lisa. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, and then uh, finally, we have uh, Chris Holland joining us. He's a Houston-based uh, attorney and fifth generation Texan. Uh, Chris earned his Bachelor of Arts uh, from Morehouse College. Uh, he completed a joint program with Yale Law School and Harvard Business School, uh, earning his JD and his uh, MBA. Uh, Chris is admitted in the state bar in Texas and for the Southern District of Texas and the federal side. Uh, and Chris was the interim uh, Harris County clerk uh, and Chief Elections Officer of Harris County, Texas uh, last year. So uh, thank you, Chris, for joining us. Uh, we have a, a, a great panel, so I wanna jump right into it. Uh, uh, Lisa, I'm gonna kick off with you uh, and talk a little bit about, uh, you know, election officials increasingly are facing pressure to prioritize uh, their partisan, partisan interests over a fair democratic process. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about any structural changes that are needed to uh, insulate election administrators uh, during this highly polarized moment? If there, what are some of the things that we should be looking for? Thanks, Edgardo. Um, before I launch into the answer to that question, I do just want to highlight that in talking about challenges to the independence of election officials, we're talking about interference with the ability of election officials to do their jobs. And that is a result of a political or cultural shift that occurred in the last several years where actions that previously had been considered ministerial, like certifying an election that has already been counted, became points of controversy and contention. Um, areas where people were asserting power because they presume they could rather than following fair process. So I, I provide all that as context because I think it's an important recognition when we think about structural changes. There is no silver bullet. The silver bullet would be to fix our political culture, right? But since it seems like that's not going to be an easy fix, structural changes need to come into play. There are a few things that were mentioned in the recent report that was issued today based on interviews with, uh, you know, I think around 40 different local election officials. The one that I want to highlight first is uh, the creation of essentially independent agencies within the states to house election administration. And uh, that type of independent agency would need to have at least two building blocks. First, it would need to have 
a protected scope of authority at a bare minimum, things like counting ballots and certifying elections that would be free from political interference. And that would need to be combined with a guaranteed baseline of funding to make sure that uh, legislative branches can't interfere to try to influence the counting or certification of ballots and elections. I think that's a really important consideration. It could be modeled on things like the former Wisconsin Government Accountability Board, um, independent redistricting commissions. Internationally, there are election uh, commissions. There are lots of formats that um, could be followed. Again, because this is a new issue, there is no exact model to use. Some quick things to reference also that others have recommended. Academics like Larry Diamond, Rick Hazen, and Dan Tokaji have recommended um, that election officials should be appointed and nonpartisan as they are in much of the world. And um, Chris Thomas, former Michigan election director and also part of BPC has recommended nonpartisan non election of election officials. Thank, thank you, Lisa. Uh, thanks for that background, that context uh, for some of this discussion and, and for uh, kind of some of the the broad ideas for uh, things we can do that in this space. Uh, Aaron, you um, uh, deal with a state association of election officials. Um, ha have you seen in talking to your members uh, across Ohio uh, kind of ideas or thoughts around structural changes uh, to insulate folks from, from the sort of partisan pressure they've been facing uh, that has really ramped up in, in the past year? Yeah, it's interesting, Agardo. We we in Ohio we celebrate the fact that we are you know bipartisan, one hundred percent. So we have four members on our boards of elections, and there's two Republicans and two Democrats. And the director and the deputy director are always of opposite political parties and opposite of what the chair is. So we really celebrate that bipartisanship. Yet at the same time, we're, we're partisan. <laughs> so it creates some interesting dynamics where you do uh, certainly take off your political hat when you walk in the office at 830 and you, you might put it back on at five o'clock or whatever and go knock on doors for your for your local political party. But you're expected, candidly, as Lisa was saying, to behave in a nonpartisan way. So that that's the thing that my folks are really struggling with is is how do we how do we kind of become uh, nonpartisan when we are inherently products of a partisan system? And that's those are those are the issues we're trying to grapple with right now. And Justin, I, uh, I saw you nodding when the discussion, the, the brief discussion on Michigan uh, and Chris Thomas. And, and so uh, what have you seen in terms of those, uh, the, the need for those structural changes or things to uh, kind of insulate folks? I know Michigan, obviously, uh, uh, you all experienced a lot of challenges uh, last cycle uh, in terms of uh, the threats and the vitriol. Uh, do you have thoughts on on what might help there? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to, to echo the point that, um, you know, has already been made in terms of you know, much like across the country, Michigan operates very similarly with partisan election officials who are elected on a, on a partisan ticket. Uh, Michigan's unique with our uh, decentralized system, you know, similar to Wisconsin and, and, uh, in the fact that we have municipal clerks you know, kind of at the forefront of the election process. We have 83 county clerks, but we have almost 1,200 municipal clerks at that, at that level as well who are on the forefront. And the majority of all of those election officials are elected on the partisan level. So I do think, you know, I think we need some fundamental restructuring of what our actual process looks like. And I, I really do think we should give serious consideration um, to Chris Thomas's uh, suggestion, right, that that maybe we need to elect our election officials and have them, you know, accountable to and responsible to the voters, but have them in in some kind of a nonpartisan fashion. The other thing I think that was mentioned, obviously, in the in the report as well, but a code of ethics um, that really is adhered to by election officials, similarly to you know a, a number of a number of uh, people in in public office or holding positions of public trust where um, they're relied on for public trust, um, we need stronger mechanisms for that. And I think we really do, you know, in, 
and I know similar to a lot of other states, but in Michigan, you know, county clerks and election officials can donate and uh, campaign for other candidates, and many, many do. Um, I, I think that is also a challenge. You know, in many states, we see secretaries of state campaigning for particular, you know, uh, candidates for for uh, president, and all the way on down, right, to uh, to county and local officials. So I think we really do have to address some simple rules and and a code of ethics that can be just adhered to. And I think that also gives protection to election officials in that way. Thanks, Justin. And, and uh, Chris, I, um, I, I'd be happy for you to, to share if you have additional thoughts on, on that. But um, as I uh, think about, you know, the things that we saw uh, last, you know, heading into last November, uh, you uh, were kind of in, in the, uh, you know, one of many who was uh, the target of, of a lot of things in terms of uh, the attempts that you were making to um, uh, to utilize what was available to make it easier for voters to access the process. Uh, and, and in response to kind of what you did and, and what other election officials across the country did to make sure that people could actually participate, uh, there's been a push to kind of uh, uh, to enact new laws this year uh, we've seen during legislative sessions that include provisions for penalizing election officials for doing their job, basically. Uh, what are your thoughts on kind of how that how that's going to impact upcoming elections, kind of how, uh, you know, the, those laws weren't on the books last November. I think you were still in court a number of times uh, on some of these issues uh, in, in that context of, uh, you know, trying to uh, penalize what you just doing your job. So. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your your thoughts on that and and how you think that's going to impact things going forward? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and just to touch on the previous point, I you know I agree with with uh, what's been put out there by my colleagues. Uh, when I was in office as county clerk, that is that's an elected position. You can be a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, you know, I chose, although it was not the law, to to not endorse anyone, to stay out of, of partisan politics, and to simply focus on administering uh, the election. Now, in Texas, counties have the option, but not the, uh, but but are not uh, forced to enter into sort of a nonpartisan election official uh, engagement. And, and I served uh, very proudly as the last partisan election official in Harris County. We've now moved to a nonpartisan election administrator. And we were the last of the major counties in Texas to do so, but there are still hundreds of other counties that have that have partisan election officials. So that's important. But but the one thing I was going to touch on is exactly what you asked me. You know, one of the most important things in terms of insulating uh, elections officials is not to have them uh, open to frivolous lawsuits um, and now frivolous criminal penalties based on potential uh, mistakes in administration or for simply doing their job too well by making voting too accessible uh, to their constituents, which is, which is what uh, you know, sort of we were on the hook for in Harris County. We were sued dozens of times by, by deep-pocketed uh, actors um, who their cases were thrown out, thrown out, thrown out over and over again. Um, and and frankly, there was no limitation on their ability to do that. And that cost us county resources. It cost us time that we could have been focused more on, uh, on our job. And ultimately, again, we were proud that 1.7 million people in the Houston area were able to cast ballots and do so safely and conveniently. Um, but there's certainly going to be uh, a chilling effect, you know, what we say going forward on election officials doing anything outside of the lines to help voters and that's a real problem uh and beyond that when you when you put put in laws which are being proposed in texas right now to not only penalize the the elected or appointed election official but also the volunteers who serve their community we had over eleven thousand of them in harris county in 2020 you know you're not going to have you know corporations telling their folks to take a day off to go help their community because those people could end up in jail and not be available to come back to work the next day. That is a, that is a huge problem. And then of course, the, the laws that affect the voters themselves uh, for small mistakes that they could make in trying to vote legitimacy, 
they risk jail time. And in Texas, um, there's a distinct case of a woman spending time in prison for a totally honest mistake in voting. And her vote, Frank, didn't even count to begin with. Uh, and so those laws are deeply, deeply troubling. And I, I imagine we'll get into some federal legislation discussion going forward. But as any type of federal legislation that's going to protect our democracy needs to address uh, these criminal penalties that, that scare off voters, but also scare off well-meaning volunteers and public servants uh, from ultimately making sure that we have free and fair elections throughout this country. Thank you, Chris. Uh, yes, yeah, so we'll be talking a little bit about uh, federal legislation. Uh, and, and actually, um, maybe we can uh, kind of pivot to that. Uh, you know, obviously, there's been a lot of discussions in Congress uh, uh, around the For the People Act, um, HR1 and, and S1. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, that that's kind of in process. But outside of those uh, outside of those changes, are, are there other things uh, that Congress can look at uh, in terms of the short and long term uh, for helping, you know, address some of these issues? Because some of the things that you've mentioned are are have been covered in some of these, uh, you know, in the proposed legislation that's out there. Uh, but other things we're, we're kind of learning about and figuring out how to deal with. And so are there, um, uh, Chris, and I'll start with you since, since you raised it, but, but are there kind of other things uh, that Congress can do, uh, regardless of kind of the status of, of H.R. 1, the For the People Act, uh, to, to focus on these issues and to help improve elections uh, in the short term and in the long term? Yeah, well, I imagine, you know, others on this panel can speak uh, more intelligently about, you know, the details of the laws being proposed. Uh, but what I can say from where I'm sitting is that, you know, preclearance uh, is absolutely necessary when it comes to laws that affect uh, our democracy, that affect free and fair elections uh, across the United States. Uh, you know, we've seen how that uh, opened up the doors of democracy uh, for all of our populations from the 1960s forward. And the, again, bipartisan legislation that was extended and extended by, uh, by presidents of all political stripes up until very recently. And, you know, uh, you know, I liken this to somebody who's, you know, planning a vacation for their family, but hasn't even put food on the table that night, right? For our folks who are up in, in DC passing all these laws that are meant to benefit Americans, and of course, folks have different views on what those are, if you haven't figured out the, the basics of democracy and covered that yet, everything else is gonna ultimately fall apart. Um, and so our folks at the federal level, uh, particularly in the Senate, you know, have to figure out how to get behind and support legislation that is going to ensure that our democracy exists tomorrow. Because if we as a country aren't alive, then all those other things that they aspire to are, are totally uh, useless and will lie you know, in the wake of, of the destruction that we've seen over the past few months. And uh, thank you, Chris. And Aaron, I know uh, you have been uh, a, a head of a, a state uh, election official association, uh, are, are often part of those discussions around what can Congress do uh, uh, around elections? You know, obviously, uh, uh, local election officials uh, run, uh, you know, run federal elections. Uh, and so there is some shared responsibility there. And so can, can you give us a little bit of, of insight into uh, your thoughts around what, what Congress can do, um, you know, on, on this front? Sure. Money. <laughs> I would love to take Congress's money uh, and was really disappointed that, you know, some of the good efforts of folks on this call and BPC and at the Brennan Center uh, were more fruitful last year because I think we had a real uh, easy case to make to Congress that we actually needed some resources to get through next year. And, you know, fortunately for us, they came from other sources. Um, but, you know, that that's probably another topic we could talk about at great length. Um, but no, I, I maybe I'm old fashioned. I'm not as interested in the, the policies coming out of D.C. I, I tend to think that we do run local elections in this country. And I think that the local election administrators know best how to conduct those elections and know what works for their citizens. So I'm not as interested in maybe one size fits all solutions coming out of DC, but I do think that 
Congress has responsibility to help us uh, financially um, to get through these elections. So uh, that, that's my short answer, I guess. All right. And, and Lisa, uh, I know you obviously have worked um, on federal legislative issues uh, for, for a long time. So do you have uh, kind of additional thoughts to add on that front? Uh, yes, I think I would add two things. First of all, um, while uh, the For the People Act is not necessarily specifically addressed to issues around um, challenging the independence of election officials, its attempt to provide uniformity in certain processes, say around counting the ballots, how to deal with mail ballots, does provide some level of insulation for election officials in simply following the law and, and doing things in a uniform manner across the country. I do, in addition, want to echo Aaron's first point, which I thought he, he got off of too quickly, which has to do with funding. Um, you know, one of the huge issues we found when we did the interviews underlying the report related to the hugely unsustainable workload of local election officials, precisely because uh, election administration offices are staffed very leanly and um, there are simply not enough bodies to handle the increasing complexity of election administration. And then, um, and I promise this will get back to the issue around money. Um, <laughs> uh, if you look at the example of the 2020 election and you think about the pandemic, election officials had to prepare for multiple elections at the same time with no knowledge of what would really play out. Election officials had to plan for in-person elections. They had to plan for uh, mail ballot elections, right? In order to make voting safe and accessible to people. And there simply were not adequate resources. And by resources, I mean kind of bodies and funding in order to really make the process safe. In the CARES Act, Congress provided, uh, I think it was 400 million dollars, um, but that wasn't sufficient and then didn't go ahead and provide more and private philanthropies had to step in to fill that uh, funding hole. Now legislatures, um, as part of this politicization, are um, prohibiting that private funding from coming in to fund what's really necessary. I mean, again, I get back to election officials are trying to do their jobs and they're doing it with so few resources, Congress can and really should step in and fix this. If I could uh, maybe pick up on some of those points that Lisa is making, because I think they're outstanding. Think, think about you know folks like like Chris and Justin, and how many hats they have to wear just to get through one election. I mean, they're the CEO of their of their organization. They're they're in all likelihood the chief financial officer, the chief information officer, the public information officer, the chief legal counsel, the HR expert. You know, they wear all these hats. Those could be positions positions unto themselves within any election you know organization. In Ohio, uh, over half of our counties have four staff people or less. Uh, Eighty of our eighty eight counties. Uh, have a population that's less than our fifth biggest county. So it's, you know, so these aren't um, well-resourced uh, operations as far as, as personnel and staffing. And to the extent that we can identify those resources and just dedicate people uh, to trying to fill those roles and those gaps, I think would be hugely beneficial for the public and free folks up to, you know, to really focus on the administration of elections as opposed to have, you know, to work 80 hour weeks for, the three months leading up to the election and probably 120 hours the week before. It's just not sustainable, like Lisa was saying. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Aaron, for jumping in there. Uh, I, and I do have, uh, I, I wanna uh, shift gears here a little bit because I, I um, wanna follow up on something that Lisa touched on, uh, but also take an audience question uh, at, at the same time. Um, and so uh, just as a reminder, uh, you can submit questions uh, using the live chat on YouTube or Facebook or on Twitter uh, using the hashtag BCC Live. 
Uh, and so we will try to get through as many questions as we can today. Uh, and so we have a question from uh, Gary Gale, uh, which was uh, for Chris. Uh, but I think Lisa touched on, on some of this in terms of standards, but the, the question for Chris was, uh, are there fairness issues uh, when your county had 24 hour voting and drive through voting uh, when no other counties in Texas did. And, and Chris, I know you mentioned in terms of structure, there's also kind of differences in, in terms of how different counties are, are set up. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And this, this actually touches on, uh, you know, something I was going to mention, you know, based on Aaron's comment a moment ago as well, uh, which is, you know, I believe that democracy should have a floor and, and not a ceiling, right? I agree with you, Aaron, completely that we shouldn't have one size fits all elections across the United States, but we should have a floor for what democracy means and, and provide that bare minimum uh, to people across this country. Now, coming back to the, the specific question there in Texas, uh, a couple of things. One, we weren't the only county to have drive through voting. Uh, we were the one that had a target on our back because uh, we were a large, diverse, uh, you know, apparently, you know, blue county. And so we were the ones that, that folks we really shot their arrows at. But there were rural uh, and urban counties across Texas, uh, a handful that had drive through voting. And a number of them had extended hours also. Um, but we followed the same laws that, that they were following. And even now, because the laws in Texas haven't yet passed, there is no limitation on the hours of voting that you can offer. Any county can offer the, the, the hours, again, with a, with a minimum threshold that they would like to. And frankly, it wasn't much of a resource issue to offer extended hours. Uh, for a county the, 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 the size of Harris County, which has a multi-billion dollar budget, to have 24-hour voting for one night, which is all we did, it wasn't 24-hour voting for three weeks or anything like that, it was for one night, it costs us about $10,000. That's a very small number for us. Uh, to do that same thing in a smaller county, to have one or two locations where you just kept the lights on for an extra shift would cost them in the hundreds of dollars. And I'm not exaggerating that. And so if they wanna offer that to their, to their constituents, they absolutely should. And, and we encourage it. Our hope was that you know, we set a, a standard that other folks would want to emulate. If they don't want to, that's fine as long as they offer what I believe to be a bare minimum of democracy uh, in their counties. But I certainly don't think we should put a ceiling or a cap on voting access at all. We should highly encourage uh, local jurisdictions if they want to commit those resources to do so. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, to, to kind of wrap up that discussion around congressional, it sounds like uh, kind of a floor for, uh, for voting uh, requirements uh, but also funding, right? Those two things go hand in hand, as, as everybody here, I think, uh, ha has mentioned. Um, I also want to jump to another um, audience question from Jen Fuentes. Uh, and Justin, I, I want to turn to you because you uh, uh, talked a little bit, uh, touched on this issue a little bit earlier uh, around uh, partisanship. But uh, the, the question was, uh, was really how do those nonpartisan officials uh, like as an elected official, uh, how do you remain nonpartisan when you're on the job? Like, how do you avoid, how do you actually avoid that partisanship? I think both you and Aaron kind of mentioned this. Uh, it is a tricky, uh, right? It's a very tricky thing. Uh, and so can you talk a little bit, uh, a little bit more about how to avoid that, that sort of partisanship when you're in these roles, even if you're, uh, you know, even if you got there through a partisan process? I think that's a very challenging thing, you know, when you think about the, the process and the structure we have in America, right, for, for promoting people through the process of public office. Um, it, it's difficult. It's difficult for third party candidates. It's certainly very difficult for, for independent candidates um, when, when there are these partisan structures in place for the offices. Um, and, and something that Chris had, had touched on a little bit ago was the fact that he you know, I just kind of made the personal decision not to endorse and not to contribute uh, to political campaigns. And that's exactly what I've done in my role as well. I mean, I just, I, I feel like the vote counter needs to remain neutral. And I think that's so important. And I think, you know, kind of back to that code of ethics discussion, I think um, 
you know, something that election officials can do themselves is to kind of set that model and that code of ethics. And what I find is that, you know, maybe the, maybe the people within my political party that I'm talking to um, don't necessarily uh, like it or agree, but my neighbors seem to really think it makes sense, right? Like when I say, well, I'm the county clerk, I don't endorse candidates, you know, I don't put yard signs in my yard. I don't, I don't, uh, you know, I think those are things that are very tangible things that just make, make sense for people on a common sense level. Um, but I do think what would really help to insulate, uh, you know, us as election officials is a little bit more of a broad standard, you know, for our state associations to come up and, 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 and take more of a, of a leadership role in saying, you know, this is a specific code of ethics that we're requiring people to adhere to, um, you know, th because this matters. I think we have a responsibility of the democratic process to be more neutral. Thank you, Justin. And, and uh, I, I want to pivot a little bit uh, based on that uh, to Lisa and ask, um, you know, is there a way for outside actors to help uh, defend election administrators from attacks on their independence and, and kind of help to insulate them? Like, what role do outside actors have uh, in, in this process? If, if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. I think there are at least two different categories of outside actors who can really come in and help and support election officials to defend them in terms of these challenges uh, and partisan pressures. I think the first group of outside actors, quite frankly, are lawyers, right? Um, this comes through in two different ways. First of all, because of the increased complexity of the job that has been discussed already during this panel, um, there's a lot that election officials need to consider and they don't necessarily have uh, legal resources throughout the election cycle to consult with. So I think, first of all, there may be, uh, there is the possibility of outside pro bono assistance in that regard. And also when election officials are subject to the kind of frivolous lawsuits that Chris was referencing, uh, pro bono assistance from lawyers can also be quite helpful. In fact, um, Ben Ginsburg and Bob Bauer wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. It was published, I think, maybe a week ago or so, discussing these issues and referencing setting up a network of uh, lawyers to provide assistance. I don't have any inside track on what's happening with that, but it's clearly getting a lot of attention. And of course, we recommend something similar in our report. I would say the second category of outside actors, um, and depending on how you define outside, are the state associations that uh, represent the interests of election officials. And I'm sure Aaron can speak to this more, but in particular, one of the issues that comes up is that um, legislatures very rarely consult local election officials as they're considering changes in policy. And the more that can be institutionalized by um, consulting with state elect, sorry, state associations to get input, I think the less um, partisan influence you'll see because there will be that input from the front line about the needs of actually administering the elections. So I would say those are the two categories where, of outside actors that can be helpful. Yeah. Aaron, uh, Lisa did just uh, kind of <laughs> mention the role of, uh, of state association. I don't know if, uh, if there's anything you'd like to add on that front or not. Well, we only have 22 minutes left, so I'll, I'll try not to take it all talking about state associations and the role that I think they can play. But no, I'm glad Lisa mentioned that. I'm, I'm super encouraged. Just in the past 10 years or so, I think there's been a really, I don't know if it's a renewed interest or a new interest in how state associations can be helpful in elections. And I've, I've talked, you know, I'm an executive director of my association. There's a handful of us around the country and we, we talk and compare notes and Pam Anderson has certainly led the charge and Tammy Patrick's doing some great work. I want to give her a shout out as well um, over at the Democracy Fund, trying to bring state associations into the equation and, and how we can be there and be a voice for our members and be that insulating voice uh, as well. So we're very active at the, at the 
legislature. I mean, there's uh, several election reform bills in Ohio that are going through, uh, and I'm happy to say that I think we've been um, pretty effective in getting the voice of local election officials heard and considered. Uh, that doesn't mean they always listen to you, but certainly, you know, if you're not at the table, you're you're on the menu, as they say. And so, just being at the table, I think, is important for local election officials. So, yeah, we're we're proud to, proud to play that role, and I'm I'm encouraged to see other states kind of emulating that and starting to get more involved. If I could just jump in on, on, you know, what Aaron was saying as well, I think that is one of the critical reasons why I personally think it's important for uh, election officials to be elected because that engagement and interaction with voters is critical. Um, you know, I, I need to be able to talk to my legislators as a fellow elected official. And I think sometimes that's very helpful um, because we have the same constituencies. Um, and I think one thing that election officials can do, and I think sometimes we're not always good at this, right? We, um, what I like to say is, you know, we're, we're super nerds. We like to, to dig into the work. We focus on the work that we're doing. Um, our, our goal is to do a good job of that. A lot of us have this administrative mindset, but I think something that we need to hone a little bit more um, are those communication skills and that engagement with, with the public and with the voters, because you know, our legislators have um, an agenda and they, they, are, they are hearing from voters and we need to step up to the plate as election administrators and also have that same level of engagement and communication with voters. Um, and, and kind of in, in giving our perspective and our side and standing up for voters as well. Um, but I think exercising that muscle a little bit more of communicating and communicating with a broader spectrum of our you know, constituents and making sure that we can kind of put ourselves on the same playing field as our legislators is really important. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for that addition, Justin. I, I think um, it, it is definitely a difficult thing um, uh, in terms of the interaction with, with legislators. Um, I wanna turn back to uh, something that uh, I think everybody here has touched on in, in terms of uh, kind of workload and capacity um, and, uh, you know, the, just the multitude of things. And we talk about, you know, the, the hope that, that federal funding comes along with, you know, uh, regardless of anything else that's going on, uh, to pitch in, but obviously you all have talked about kind of, uh, of state resources that are needed. And Chris talked about kind of county budgets. Um, uh, do you all have any ideas in terms of, uh, of creative way, you know, other than the, the kind of funding issue, uh, are there other uh, creative ways that you all have come across in terms of adding more capacity uh, to assist as you all are trying to, you know, make these elections happen? Uh, I know Lisa has, has looked at this issue uh, kind of across the country. And, and so Lisa, maybe I can, I can start with you uh, in terms of this question and, and then everybody, anybody else wants to jump in. I feel like I need to start the way Aaron did in the last question where like, okay, we have 12 minutes left or something like that. Cause I could speak about this for a while, but I'll, I'll try to keep it summarized. Um, I think there have been a lot of uh, ways of creatively creating capacity across the country. Um, so to highlight, I guess, four different things. Um, the first is uh, state chief election officials creating a core of backup workers. And I think this has been more something that's been suggested rather than implemented, but basically to create a pool of folks who can be dispatched in jurisdictions where needed. Um, that could be just, you know, helpful staff, or it could be something that uh, Noah Prates recommended. He's uh, a former local election official and a founder of the elections group, and he recommended something called a force augmentation team, um, where for those areas that require specific expertise, like cybersecurity or communication support, or maybe even legal, that the state chief election official could pull together these teams again to dispatch folks where needed. I think the second thing worth uh, mentioning is an approach that Arizona took really successfully in the 2020 election. Um, two different programs, one called Democracy Corps, which was a fellowship program, I think mostly pulling graduate students, uh, maybe undergrads as well, um, 
for three full-time positions for the entirety of the 2020 election cycle. And uh, what that did was both provide those additional uh, folks for staffing for the year, but also um, created potential candidates to become local election officials in the future, kind of dealing with something we haven't quite addressed uh, yet during this panel, but the need to uh, replenish the ranks of retiring election officials. Um, they also, Arizona also used an internship program that brought in 50 interns over the summer to help deal with ballot initiatives. And again, found that bringing in those interns actually increased um, the efficacy of the work. It was done better for less money. And then of course you have a whole pool of ambassadors who go out into the world to share the news about what election administration is really like. And then I know I promised four, but I collapsed two of them. So I'll just go with number three, which is in jurisdictions, uh, in some jurisdictions in Pennsylvania, the local jurisdictions shared uh, workers. So, um, you know, basically uh, borrowing folks from other jurisdictions to do similar types of jobs. And also um, in situations where other local government agencies had workers who weren't as busy, kind of borrowed employees. So those are the different creative ways that states and local jurisdictions have been staffing in the absence of additional official election administration bodies. Thank if, I, if I could thank stop you, Lisa. real yeah. quick, I, one other one other thing probably we should mention: technology and automation. We we should, as election officials, demand access to the same technology that everyone else has, and we should use that creatively. Um, I think they're doing some cool stuff around petitions in Denver, for example, using iPads and and kind of eliminating a lot of the human back end uh, signature checks that have to be done. So we should absolutely take every opportunity to look at technology and integrate that into our systems and processes to be more efficient. Great. Uh, I, I want to, as we uh, uh, kind of close up here, I, I want to pivot. Uh, Lisa talked about uh, folks doing work and then going out and singing the praise of what election officials do. Uh, I, I want to talk about, you know, the, the fact that, uh, you know, it happens after every election cycle. Well, we do seem to, post-2020, have uh, had a lot of election officials decide to uh, leave the field uh, due to some of the issues we, we've talked about, um, uh, some of the things that were talked about earlier. Um, so how do we, and, and Chris, I may want to want to turn to you as uh, someone who recently uh, left a, as clerk uh, a, of a large county, but how do we go about recruiting the next generation of election officials? You know, how do we uh, grow these networks? How, how do we get people uh, interested in the field, given all the uh, kind of things that we've talked about, like how do you convince somebody that, hey, this is still like a really good uh, thing to do and, and you should want to, uh, you should want to take this on. Uh, do, you, do you have some thoughts to, to give us on that front? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, in 2020, the way that many of the initiatives that we brought to bear came about was just from looking at the private sector, right? We looked at McDonald's and Chick-fil-A to figure out drive through voting. We looked at our grocery stores to figure out how to make things move quicker in our queues. Uh, this is this is no different, right? The the way you get somebody to to be excited about taking on a career is to offer them that opportunity uh, to make sure that there are real rewards, that there's a real career path, uh, that you're building out a pipeline when, when it comes to sort of internships uh, and, and community relations. But, you know, honestly, I, I don't think there will be a shortage of young people looking to get involved in this. I mean, I think um, some of these battles that we find ourselves in right now have drawn so much more attention to this job. And, and I've, I won't say I've been inundated, but I've gotten quite a few calls and emails from young people who are looking to, to run for county clerk in their counties. Um, and so, but I think we should just follow, you know, the nuts and bolts of, you know, how to get people uh, jazzed about careers in general, which is to make them aware that it exists, uh, to talk about the attractive nature of it, why it's important, uh, to make sure that, again, there's budget there, that folks can come in and have uh, a starting salary that they can support their families, 
And then if they can see a career path where they can imagine themselves spending 10, 20 plus years. Great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and uh, Justin, I, I'll turn to you uh, to, to see if there's anything uh, you'd like to add on, on that front. I, I think Chris, you know, it, it really made some great points. One, one of those critical factors that he mentioned too was that pipeline of talent, right? And and for us, we really value our internship program here within my office. And, uh, you know, we've hired uh, interns uh, who have worked with us. And we've also seen other interns go on in other areas uh, within election administration elsewhere. And I think that is so critical as well. Um, and, and just the reality that, you know, one of the positives we're dealing with right now is that there is engaged interest in this process. Um, we just opened up an interview uh, uh, process recently for a position within our office, and it was remarkable the number of candidates who applied who, who really do, did have a passion for, and honestly, a little bit of experience in the, in the field as well, which I think is something that we're seeing shift a little bit, the professionalization of election administration, and that's very encouraging. But I think one of the things we really have to hit on is the resources that are allocated to that. You know, my, my entire elections division budget is 2% of my county's budget. And that's not uncommon. Um, I think something that report touched on is the average election official salary was something somewhere around 50,000, I believe, uh, which is 20,000 below the average salary of, of someone else in um, you know, the other, uh, other fields that are similar. And so I think we really do have to focus even locally, you know, local uh, and state governments investing in those resources too. Great. And uh, Aaron, um, I don't know, in, in terms of Ohio, if you've seen kind of a, uh, you know, the years you've been there, if, if the kind of turnover uh, post the 2020 election seems to be uh, greater than or kind of on par with prior cycles. But uh, but do you have thoughts on on like how to how to get people in into this field and how to, uh, you know, how to gain access to that talent to make sure that uh, we have election officials uh, coming in that are, you know, as dedicated as the ones that are uh, that are choosing to leave. Sure. I, I mean, huge brain drain in Ohio. We're losing a lot of people who have been here 30 plus years that are retiring after 2020. So we're not unique in that regard at all. Yeah. I mean, Chris and, and Justin made pretty much every point I wanted to make with maybe the exception of one. And I just I think we need to continue to look. And this is a role we try to play as an association um, for professional development and continuing education opportunities. So I love it when I get an email from an election official that's somewhere else in the country and I see CIRA, you know, in their, in their tagline, in their email signature line, you know, just, just like uh, Chris puts JD next to his, I'm sure, you know, that's a badge we should wear with honor and we should strive, you know, to professionalize the profession and to teach people, young people coming into this profession, that it's honorable, uh, that it is real. It's, it, it's a, career. It's a profession. It's not the, the dumping ground of patronage that it might've been, you know, 30 years ago where, you know, you just needed, you know, the, the party chairman's nephew needed a job. I'll put him at the board of elections. <laughs> you know, it's like, you can't have that anymore. It's just too important to work. It's too difficult to work. And we need to look for ways to professionalize. And I think Justin and, uh, and Chris made some, some outstanding suggestions along those lines. Great. Thanks, Aaron. And, and Lisa, finally, I'll, I'll turn over uh, to you on this question. I want to make sure uh, that everybody got a chance to weigh in here because I think this is uh, a, I think this is a super important question that I think uh, generally we face in elections, but I think after uh, you know all the issues that came up last year and that we're continuing to see as a result of the 2020 election in terms of uh, threats people are facing and the just kind of increased workload and and what seems to be uh, just a lot of turnover, um, you know, making sure that, that we're able to recruit people into those positions. And, and so, Lisa, I want to make sure uh, that I, I give you an opportunity to weigh in on that as well. Thanks, Edgardo. Well, first of all, I want to say how happy I am to hear what Chris had to say about the interest of young people in uh, working in elections. It's particularly important to have a pipeline, as everybody has referenced, in light of the statistic that something like 35% of current local election officials are eligible for retirement by 2024. And we know that I think in Pennsylvania, about a third of the election officials have uh, left or retired post 2020. So we are really um, facing somewhat of a drain of our local election officials. 
And I kind of want to pause there and again, bring this back to the humanity of our election officials, right? They are the people who are making democracy work on the front line. They are our public servants and they deserve to have good jobs. These jobs should be workable. They shouldn't have to be working themselves to death. In our um, interviews, we heard from multiple folks about the inability to take vacation. One local election official um, who had to put on four elections every year had two and a half years worth of unused vacation time. That's not sustainable and it makes it a job that is less desirable. We really need to make these jobs better for people so that we can have the competent, amazing election officials that we have had up to this point. I think I have more to say, but I feel like I'm running out of time. So thanks. <laughs> Lisa, I, I think, I, I mean, if you if you had something additional on that, I, I think, if, you know, this is, uh, like I said, I think it's super important uh, question and issue that we're, uh, that we're grappling with. So I think if, if there are kind of additional points, I think the audience would certainly uh, appreciate that. <laughs> You're too kind, Edgardo, if you <laughs> insist. <laughs> so first I would say, you know, we talked about the ways to create additional capacity and staffing, and I think that's really important. I also think that it's important to try to consolidate election calendars so that folks, uh, because offices are staffed so leanly, People just can't take off. There's nobody to fill in for them. And when you're constantly gearing up for elections and then doing the count and then gearing up for another one, there's just not the time or ability to take off and re-energize. Um, I think those are all really important things in terms of making the job better. And then in terms of uh, recruitment of new folks, um, there are a lot of things that can be done in conjunction primarily with um, colleges and universities. There are the internship programs that folks have talked about. There's Democracy Corps that was put into place in Arizona. There are um, opportunities for undergraduate and graduate certificates through University of Minnesota and Auburn University, and those kinds of programs should be expanded where folks can study election administration, especially since there is this uh, larger interest among young people. Um, I think election officials should try to partner more with poll worker recruitment organizations, right? There was uh, Power of the Polls, and I think another one called Poll Hero, which really catalyzed young people to become poll workers in 2020. Those poll workers are a future pool for local election officials. So I think all those things are really important. And um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say more. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, and I think uh, we're going to wrap up. I, uh, this has been a wonderful panel. Uh, we could, I think all of us keep going uh, for, for hours on, on these important topics, but, uh, but Lisa, uh, Justin, Chris, Aaron, I want to thank all of you uh, for all the work that you've done and continue to do on these issues and, and for joining us uh, this afternoon uh, on this panel on these very important topics. So uh, thank you all very much. And I, I think uh, we have some closing remarks uh, from Miles Rappaport. Um, I'm not sure how that, how we will turn that over. There's Miles. Uh, so, so Miles, I think you're going to close us out today. Uh, so thank you again to the panelists and, and thanks for inviting me to, uh, be a moderator of such a, uh, such an amazing group of folks. Great. Thanks, Edgardo. Thank you for, uh, uh passing it on to me. Listen, I just want to say on behalf of the Ash Center, uh, first of all, thanks to the, my colleagues at the Brennan Center, at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, who have done the really excellent and heavy lifting on this project and produced an excellent report that I hope will get a lot of attention. Uh, also, thanks to the exceptional panelists today, Chris, Lisa, Justin, Aaron, and Edgardo. Uh, you did a great job. Uh, I learned a lot listening to it, and I think people will as well. But especially, I want to thank all of the election officials who are out there doing their job every day, protecting our democracy, uh, operating under difficult circumstances, and really doing a, a, a great honor and service to the profession and to the, and to the country. Uh, listen, um, 
everybody, as everybody has said, we're at a fraught moment in American democracy with all the misinformation and disinformation that we're seeing, with the legislation to undermine the independence of election officials, and unfortunately, as we have heard, the threats uh, and painfully uh, painful intimidation that many have received. But at the same time, what we have all heard today and what we have seen in 2020, and what I am confident we're gonna see in 2022 as well, and 2024, are election officials at every level standing up, doing the right thing, doing their job, making sure our democracy really works. So again, I wanna thank everybody for this important project. I urge people to go and encourage other people to go and watch the YouTube video of both sessions because they were really excellent. I certainly want to encourage everyone to read the report and to circulate the report uh, to the maximum degree. It has wonderful, wonderful recommendations in it. Um, and we should be inspired to do our very best, whether we are voters or citizens or advocates or elected officials, uh, we need to set ourselves to the task of protecting and improving American democracy. And if we do that, I think America will be the better for it. So thanks everybody for coming, for being part of today's event. And uh, uh, I appreciate all of you very, very much on behalf of the Yes Center.